Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming to our History Lunch Program. I am Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. Welcome to the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium here in the two Mississippi museums. Um, I want to tell you about a few things going on. On the occasion of the 55th anniversary of Medgar Evers' death, the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum will host a program to commemorate the life of the civil rights leader, a free program co-sponsored by the Medgar and Murley Evers Institute and the Mississippi Humanities Council will be held here in this auditorium at 6 p.m. Tuesday of next week, June the 12th. It will include musical and theatrical performances as well as a panel discussion on Evers' life moderated by his biographer, Michael Williams. You all put that on your calendar. It will be a great event, 6 p.m. Tuesday next week. And then I hope that you will be able to join us for next week's History's Lunch program when Josh Foreman and Ryan Starrett will discuss their book, The Hidden History of Jackson. This room was um, already reserved for a, a big program, and so we will hold that program back over in the old Capitol Museum. So it's the one time for the rest of the year that we're going to need to move out of this space. But don't come here next week. Come to the old Capitol Museum for that program. That's, 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 we, we go there for the gravitas. Today, we are delighted to have Joe Crespino with us to present Atticus Finch and American History. His new book is Atticus Finch, The Biography, and Princeton University professor Kevin Cruz writes that in this brilliantly researched and beautifully written work, Joe Crespino explores the fictions of Atticus Finch to expose the facts about white Southerners in the age of Jim Crow. A native of Macon, Mississippi, Joe Crespino is the Jimmy Carter Professor of History at, em at Emory University. He's the author of the fine work In Search of Another Country, which won the 2008 Lillian Smith Book Award from the Southern Regional Council and the Macklemore Prize from the Mississippi Historical Society, as well as Strom Thurmond's America. He holds a bachelor's in American culture from Northwestern University, a master's in secondary school education from the University of Mississippi, and a doctorate in history from Stanford University. Help me welcome Joe Crespino. Thank you, Chris, for that introduction. I am delighted to be here. This is a, uh, a real thrill for me to be back in Jackson and to see so many uh, old friends and uh, distant cousins in some cases and, uh, and mentors. And um, it's particularly uh, fun to be at this institution. Um, this is a wonderful room and this, these are wonderful uh, museums for Mississippi to have. And I'm so uh, happy for Mississippi and happy for us all that we have a place that uh, can memorialize our history and we can come and learn it together and discuss it together. And um, it's important for us as a state and for us as a nation to have this institution. So I am really honored to be here. I, uh, I wanted, I mean, I'm excited to be here too to talk about this book, which just came out. It's a little bit different from some of the other books that I've written. I am, in most of the other books I've written, I'm kind of an old school political historian. But this is a, a book about, this is a kind of a strange book. I mean, it's a, you know, a biography of a fictional character, you know. <laughs> I mean, how do you write that? I mean, the, the nice thing about, about doing a book like this is there's no, uh, there's no right way to write a biography of a fictional character, which means that there's no wrong way to do it either. Uh, and that, that gives you a little bit of freedom. But I've been interested in this character of Atticus Finch for a long time, and for a number of different reasons. One is that, uh, you know, I love the novel. I grew up in a small town in Mississippi, in Oxby County, Macon. And, you know, and throughout uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, all the crazy characters, you know, we would have our analogs in Macon, you know, uh, of the different kinds of characters and the relationships and all that kind of thing. So, so that's always made me interested, and I've loved Harper Lee, and I've loved To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, it's also true that, you know, this character of Atticus Finch has loomed so large 
in our political culture, in our, in our, in our popular culture. You know, uh, and this is why I'm interested in the book, and this is why I really wanted to write about the book, is because the book, uh, you know, published in 1960, made into a movie, uh, Academy Award winning movie in 1962, it continues to be taught and read and discussed in remarkable ways. I mean, you think about it. This book is kind of like a, uh, a kind of primer for middle school and early high school students in which they learn about, really in many cases for the first time, and, and try to engage with, in a serious way, the history of racial injustice in the American South and in the United States. My daughter is in eighth grade. She read it this year you know, for the first time, which was interesting, uh, given what I've just written. Um, but, but this character is so, uh, is so formative for us in our political culture because the book is kind of a, a racial primer into kind of the, the politics and morality of um, race in the United States. Um, yeah, and of course it became so famous when Gregory Peck uh, became the embodiment of Atticus Finch in the movie that came out in late 62, early 1963. So, uh, you know, and, and, it's, and it's funny about Atticus Finch. Atticus Finch, almost unlike any other uh, fictional character, people forget that Atticus Finch isn't really a, isn't a real person. You know, that's kind of what my, uh, my title is kind of playing on that, Atticus Finch, the biography. Uh, one of the first, you know, you, you write this book and then you send it off and it takes months for it to get published. And so you're just waiting to hear what people think, you know. And so one of the things that my publisher did was they, they would send out these review copies to these certified reviewers on Amazon.com. And so, and so those are the first kind of feedback you have on the book. And one of the first reviews I got on Amazon.com is a two-star review. Two-star review of a guy who said, you know, I love Atticus Finch. And I was so excited to learn in this book, this Atticus Finch, the biography, I really wanted to learn about Atticus's childhood. But there's nothing in this book <laughs> about Atticus's childhood. You know? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the response sometimes you get when you start writing about Atticus Finch. I mean, people take this stuff very seriously. They love Atticus Finch and they love Harper Lee. So that's one of the occupational hazards as you think about this. But, but it is true that this book plays an important role in our, in our public life uh, and continues in the way that it's continued to be taught and, 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 and assigned in so many classrooms. And even in, in, in recent years, in, in, our, in our own times, Atticus continues to be invoked as a, figure, as a kind of touchstone of decency and empathy in our uh, public life. Just think about this uh, speech that was given in January uh, of 2017. It was President Barack Obama's farewell address. And in that farewell address, he was reflecting on his presidency and what was accomplished and what remains to be done in America today. And one of the things that President Obama talked about was even though he was the first African-American ever to be elected president of the United States, yet in his eight years in office, uh, issues and divisions of race continue to be so powerful and pervasive in American public life. And he called on Americans uh, to remember the words of Atticus Finch, the instructions that Atticus gave to Scout, that, that famous line from To Kill a Mockingbird, where you never know uh, another person until you crawl into their skin and, and, and walk around in it for a while. You know, that message of empathy that we all need to have towards one another across racial lines and across political lines remains so important, remain very important for, for Barack Obama, enough that he would invoke Atticus in, his, in this signature final speech that he gives as president. But you might have asked, uh, we might have asked President Obama, which Atticus are you talking about? When you talk about Atticus as a model of empathy. Because that became the question, right, in 2015. In the summer of 2015, 
uh, we just, uh, there was published Ghost Set of Watchmen. Harper Collins published Ghost Set of Watchmen. This was, the, was a book that was discovered in a bank deposit box in uh, Monroeville, Alabama, uh, by Harper Lee's literary executor. It was published to not little controversy. But in this book, and I don't know how many of you have read, the, how many of you read, have read To Kill a Mockingbird? Raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's pretty typical. How many of you have read uh, Ghost of a Watchman? Okay, that's pretty good. For those of you who haven't read Ghost of a Watchman, what happens in this book is that it's the adult Jean Louise, who's 26, you know, Scout is 26 years old. She comes from New York back to Maycomb, and she's visiting her family. Um, and the central development in that novel is that uh, Jean Louise realizes that Atticus, her beloved father, who wouldn't hurt a ground squirrel, who's an honorable, noble man, has fallen in with the small-minded racist reactionaries who had established the Citizens Council chapter in, in Maycomb, right? And she writes this in, in 1957. And what's interesting, what's fascinating about, uh, 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 you know, uh, Ghost Set of Watchmen, and then the novel, as it continues and as it develops, there's a series of kind of staged conversations that Jean Louise has with various men in her life, her suitor, Henry Clinton, her uncle Jack, and then Atticus himself. And, and in those conversations, Harper Lee is kind of working out kind of an analysis in many ways of the politics of race in the South in, 19, in the late 1950s. And what's fascinating about Ghost Set of Watchmen is that it, even though the action in it takes place in the 1950s, whereas the action in To Kill a Mockingbird takes place in the 1930s, she actually wrote Go set a watchman first, right? What happened was, Harper, some of the fans of Harper Lee, you will know this, right? She got this famous gift, Christmas gift, from her friends in Christmas of 1956, which allowed her to quit her job as an airline reservationist and to write uh, uninterrupted. And so she wrote, uh, she had a year to write, whatever she wanted to. This was the first time she ever sat down. She had written some short stories before, but this was the first time she tried to write a novel because that's what her agent told her would sell better, the novel. And this was the, and Ghost of a Watchman was the first thing she tried to write. She tried to write. And one of the things that I've learned in my research for this book, and this, uh, these are through ex some of the ex some exclusive sources that I had access to, from some personal letters that Harper Lee was writing to friends from Monroeville, Alabama, her, her hometown, to friends in New York. And they, they were, able, were able to place Harper Lee in Monroeville in 1956. When in, in, I went back and looked at the newspapers in Monroeville, and lo and behold, there's a lot of controversy in Monroeville in 1956 about the establishment of a Citizens Council chapter in that town, right? So in some ways, the, the action in Ghost Set of Watchmen is literally ripped from the headlines of the local newspaper, the Monroe Journal, there in Monroeville in 1956. So, so this novel, in, in, but in this novel, what's so important about Ghost Set of Watchmen is that Atticus, the beloved, noble, wise figure of To Kill a Mockingbird, in Ghost Set of Watchmen, Atticus is exactly what you suspect a 70-year-old arthritic man from South Alabama would have been like in Alabama in 1957, in the heart of the, the civil rights era, right? He's, he's not excited about the changes that are taking place in his hometown. He's a defender of states' rights. He's a, a, an old-school Southern conservative who uh, is a paternalist. You know, he has this, these kind of racially paternalistic views where he thinks that white folks uh, are, the, are, are more advanced and they need to help black folks kind of come along, but they need to come along really slowly, right, and really gradually. You know, that was the, he was a kind of orthodox segregationist uh, uh, racist, um, in, in Ghost Set of Watchmen. And of course, you know, this was shocking news in 2015. All those folks who had named their children Atticus, what do they do, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the problem, right, you know? Start using their, their middle names uh, after Ghost Set of Watchmen comes out. Um, but this is what, 
set me off to write this book. I had been interested in this, in, in Atticus and in this book and in its role in our political culture and public culture, all that, for a long time. But this gave me momentum to go and, and, and do my work as a historian because what we have now is change over time. We have a version of Atticus written in 19, early 1957 uh, that changes in, that, when, when the, when, in this other novel. And one of the things, too, that I discovered in my research, which is very important, and this came from a set of exclusive sources that came from Harper Collins, uh, Harper Lee's longtime publisher, is that when you go in those files, I was the first person to look at those files, when you go into them, you realize that it's not like Harper Lee wrote a version of Atticus and Ghost Set a Watchman, and she said, well, I'm going to make him a racist reactionary. And like, nah, I don't like that version. I'm going to throw that out, and I'm going to make him an idealistic figure. No, that's not. She always imagined these two novels in conversation with one another. She imagined them as part of one larger narrative arc, right? Um, so when she goes, when she puts down Ghost Set a Watchman, and what she, she doesn't put it down. What she happens is it's her agent is sending it out, trying to get it published, but it's not selling. People, don't, people aren't buying it because they feel like it's not enough story. There's not enough action. It's just these kind of staged conversations. And, um, and while Maurice Crane, her agent, is doing that, she is going back and she's, not, she's wanting to make the most of every minute she has in this year she has off from her job. And so she starts writing a new novel. And it's a novel based out of the short stories that she'd already written. But it's a novel uh, that's about the childhood of those characters that she had written about, about Jean Louise. And this is when she starts writing the, the, the child, those childhood stories. This is when she really finds her voice as a writer. And this is the stuff that really is just kind of flowing out of her, her typewriter. And, um, and, her, and her agent is really excited. And now she's got this material that she can sell and, and work into a book. And that's what she does. And she worked it, of course, with the help of Tejo off into the book that, we, uh, that, so, many, that so many of us have read, To Kill a Mockingbird. But what was important to me about Ghost Set a Watchman is that whatever you think about it as a work of fiction, whatever you think about it as a story, and there are plenty of people who don't think much of it as a story. I mean, and after all, it is her first novel, right? I mean, how are, how's your first novel, right? Uh, I mean, it's hard to do to write a novel. It's a hard thing to do. And it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of practice. And a lot of people's first novels, a lot of successful novelists, their first novel is in a drawer somewhere. Or like Walker Percy, you know, Walker Percy, he burned his first two novels exactly so that someone like me wouldn't come along and find them and try to make hay of them, probably. I don't know exactly why he burned them, but he did burn them. Um, but, but, so, but whatever you think about Ghost Set a Watchman as a work of fiction, it is fascinating as a historical document, as a, as a document that gives us insight into what Harper Lee was thinking about and what she was trying to do uh, when she sat down to write her first piece of, 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 of serious extended fiction in, in January of 1957. And that's, what I, that's how I approached it. And it set me off on doing a lot of other research to try to find out more about Harper Lee and the inspiration for the character of Atticus. Harper Lee always talked about, uh, in, the, in the interviews that she did give, and she didn't give a whole lot of them, right? And so the last time she ever talked publicly on the record about her fiction was in March of 1964, right? But in the interviews that she gave when Mockingbird was published and in the promotion uh, that she did around uh, the movie when it came out in 62 and 63, she talked about the inspiration for Atticus. And she talked about how her father was not Atticus exactly, but was very much the kind of inspiration for uh, the character of Atticus. Her father... Uh, Amasa Coleman Lee, or A.C. Lee, as he was called. And this is A.C. Lee, probably in his late 30s. He still looked quite boyish, but it probably was taken in his, in his late 30s. And I wanted to go and do more research, because in all of the, the things that have been written about Harper Lee, there's not a lot about her father. There, there wasn't a lot to, seemingly to find out. We just kind of the stories that the family themselves told about A.C. Lee and a handful of um, articles that he had written when he was uh, 
the editor of the newspaper there. But that was important. That, that was something I thought that people hadn't made enough of. You know, that like Atticus Finch, A.C. Lee was a small town lawyer and a state legislator in the Alabama legislature in the 20s and 30s. But he was also the owner and the editor of a newspaper for 18 years, the Monroe Journal from 1929, was it 27? 1929 to 1947. And there, you know, y'all are from, many of you are from small towns in Mississippi, so you know there's no guarantee that just because you own a newspaper that the person who's editing the newspaper would be writing editorials per se, right? I mean, in my hometown, uh, in Macon. The Macon Beacon was notorious, right, for, I mean, there was nothing in the Macon Beacon when I was growing up. I mean, there was the, there were the obituaries were on the front page because that was, that was the big news in town. I mean, it was about who died. And, um, and you know, in the, and there would be reports about who came or went visiting which relative at Easter or at Christmas, you know, that kind of thing. So I was kind of expecting that the Monroe Journal might be like that. So I didn't have very high expectations. But I went to the sister organization of the Mississippi Department of, of Archives and History. I went to the Alabama Archives in Montgomery. This is the archives crew back there in the back table. And they are, they are old friends of mine who helped me so much with my first book that I wrote about Mississippi. And so it's great to see you all and thank you all for coming out. But, um, but I went over there and I just dipped down in uh, March of 1933. I thought, that's, I'll just start with March of 1933. And I'll run this a little bit like my classroom. Why would I have started in March of 1933? What happened in March of 1933 that was significant historically? Yeah. Exactly. Gold star to you, sir. Because uh, we all inaugurate our presidents in January now, right? But, but Roosevelt was the last one to be inaugurated in March, all right? So I wanted to see, what was he, was there anything that he was writing about, about uh, Franklin Roosevelt's inauguration? And, um, and it was, I, I, I kind of stumbled upon a gold mine because not only did A.C. Lee have a weekly editorial page, but he had an active and ambitious editorial page where he was writing two, three, four editorials every week. And not just about local politics or even about Alabama politics, but he was writing about the evolution of the New Deal over the course of the 1930s. And by the late 1930s, and not so late 1930s, as early as 1936 and 1937, he's writing about the oppression of religious values in Germany. He's writing about Kristallnacht in 1938. He's writing about the rise of fascism in Japan and its ominous implications for the international order. Right? This is a man who had the highest grade he ever completed was eighth grade. That's one of the things I found out, too, in this book during research. It wasn't hard to find out. You just go to the census records. But that was one of the questions that the census takers would ask in 1930. What's the highest grade you completed? It was eighth grade. He grew up very poor, um, the, the son of a homesteader in North Florida. He had been born in Georgiana, Alabama, but his family grew up in North Florida. He lived for a very short time in, in Mississippi and across Alabama and North Florida um, he became a lawyer, but he became a lawyer in the way that a lot of poor uh, white Southerners would have become a lawyer in that era, which is you don't go to law school. You don't get a law degree, right? You just go get a job in somebody's law office and you read for the bar. You just read the books that the lawyer tells you to read and you sit for the bar and you become a lawyer. And that's how he became a, 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 you know, the uh, partner in the law firm there in Monroeville, Alabama. But, it, but, but A.C. Lee was Lincoln-esque in his habits of self-improvement and self-education, and he was a voracious reader. And so it was fascinating, and I went back and read all 18 years' worth of those editorials that he wrote. And I, I studied them, and I charted them out, and looked at the common themes, and it was remarkable to see this man who was trying to, you know, really trying to engage with the world and try to, try to kind of interpret the world to his readers there of his local newspaper. Um, and what I found over the course of reading those 18 years worth of editorials was that uh, Harper Lee always talked about how A.C. Lee was the inspiration for this idealistic figure of Atticus Finch and, and To Kill a Mockingbird. But what was also true reading those editorials is that he was also the inspiration 
for the much more problematic figure of Atticus that we see in Go Set a Watchman. Now, the idealism of A.C. Lee comes out of what I've already told you in some ways. It's the fact that he was uh, he didn't have access to, to a fancy education, and yet he grew up to be a man who was ambitious and in, in, in trying to be thoughtful and improve himself and, and engage with serious ideas and be a citizen and represent the citizenry in the, in the legislature, all that stuff. You know, he was a, he, he, Some of his editorials were these kinds of civic sermons, right, where he'd talk about uh, the, the you know Republican small R Republican values of government and small D Democratic values of government that kind of thing. He wrote a lot in the 1930s against the demagogues of Southern politics in the 1930s. He couldn't stand Huey Long. He wrote a lot about Huey Long. Louisiana is two states over, right? But he, he would begin, he had several, at one point, about eight weeks in a row, he wrote something about Huey Long. And the eighth week, he begins his editorials. I understand that some of my readers might be getting a little tired of hearing about Huey Long. <laughs> However, and he just would go straight ahead, and write, you know, he's going to tell them what he thought they needed to hear, that kind of thing. So Huey Long and Eugene Talmadge over in, uh, in Georgia, you know, these kinds of demagogues, he couldn't stand it for the way that they were amassing all of this power and crushing their political enemies, right? And this kind of thing. He thought this was a very uh, ominous influence in Southern politics. He wrote against lynching. He wrote, uh, spoke, wrote editorials against lynching. Um, although that's complicated. That's complicated. I'll just kind of buttonhole that topic and maybe we'll come back to his anti-lynching editorials. I can talk more about those in the question and answer. Um, because in some days, you know, there was very much a kind of conservative opposition uh, in the white community to lynching in the 1920s and 30s, an opposition to mob rule, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that, you, and it didn't mean for A.C. Lee that he was embracing change in the South or embracing any kind of more expansive role for African Americans in Southern public life in the 1930s. Uh, so, and that's true. And one of the things that if you read all 18 years, by the late 1930s, and certainly by the war years, A.C. Lee does not like the liberal civil rights coalition that is coming to the fore in National Democratic Party politics by the late 1930s. It starts first in terms of labor politics, and he did not like labor unions. Uh, Monroeville gets its first factory which was critical for that town holding on, really. They got, a, they got an industrial plant, a ladies hosiery manufacturer who came from Pennsylvania down to Alabama. And of course, why did they move from Pennsylvania down to Alabama? What do they have in Pennsylvania that they don't have in Alabama? Unions, right? And they come to Monroeville, which is off the beaten path. I mean, you know, it's be hard for a labor organizer to find Monroeville, Alabama. Um, and, and, and so he, and he's very opposed to unions. He's imposed to the role, opposed to the role that unions play in National Democratic Party politics and in the New Deal and the influence they have over Franklin Roosevelt and New Deal policy by the late 1930s. But he's also, by the war years, is, is writing against, this is when you begin to see all of his defenses of states' rights because what happens in the war, the war was a tumultuous time, it upset everything in Southern society, in Southern politics. And, um, and this is when we begin to see a nascent civil rights movement emerging in Alabama and in Mississippi and in Georgia in the war years, particularly as, as African-American veterans who served in World War II come back home and decide that if I'm going to risk my life fighting for democracy abroad, I ought to have it in Knoxville County, right? That's Medgar Evers. You know, Med don't miss that talk on Medgar Evers that's coming up because that was Medgar Evers' experience exactly, right? Um, and A.C. Lee's not happy about it. He's not happy about the influence that national civil rights organizations are having over Democratic uh, politicians, national Democratic politicians. And so you begin to see, uh, you can see from reading those editorials both the idealistic figure of Atticus Finch and those civic sermons and the sermons that Atticus gives and those famous summation to the, to the court and the way that the court should operate in a, in a free society and that kind of thing. But you can also see the, the segregationist, racist, uh, uh, states' rights defense of the Southern way of life 
that Atticus talks about in, in Ghosts at a Watchman. And so it's fascinating to see how Harper Lee was struggling in her, in her fiction to make sense of um, her father's legacy. So those editorials were really important for me in writing this book. But uh, there were other exclusive sources that I had that, that helped me tell the story of Atticus uh, and helped me do, you know, to try to tell a biography of a fictional character and how the character evolves over time. Because that's what we still don't understand, right? Is how do you go from the racist Atticus of Watchmen to the idealistic figure of To Kill a Mockingbird? And, you know, part of that story is just a story about the way the novels change uh, the, and, the, and the kind of story that she's trying to tell. In Ghost Set a Watchman, she's, that novel, it's not written from the perspective. It's not a first-person narrator. It's third-person omniscient. But, but it's, it's written, the central tension in that is the, is the tension between a, 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 a 26-year-old woman, you know, young woman, and, and kind of realizing that her father has feet of clay, Right? And their father's not who, and, and this happens for all of us, right? I mean, you know, we grow up and we realize our parents can't do everything, you know, and they're not as great as we thought they were. In fact, they're, for, you know, we go through that period when you think they're the worst people in the world, you know, and hopefully they grow out of that. That, ha that hits about 14. We're going through right, right now at our house, but hopefully they grow out of that. But, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the story in, in Ghost of the Watchmen. But in To Kill a Mockingbird, we, we see and we hear the, the, the drama in that novel through the eyes of Scout, by and large. I mean, that's one of the tricky things. She goes in and out of the voice of Scout in very tricky ways in To Kill a Mockingbird. But it's largely, we, we, are, we are seeing the world through the eyes of Scout, and we are experiencing through Scout, Scout and Jim's moral awakening, right, to the injustices in their own beloved small town of Maycomb. And that's what makes that novel so powerful, right? And so, um, and so we see Atticus through the eyes of a nine-year-old adolescent. And, that's, and so that's an important way to think about why the, the, the vision of Atticus, that, that our view of Atticus has to be limited to Scout's view of Atticus in a lot of ways, in To Kill a Mockingbird. So that's the literary explanation, right, of why the character changes so much. But I'm not, I, that's not sufficient enough for me, because as a historian, you know that when people write something, whatever it is they're writing, they, they are influenced very, and this is totally true of history books, right? That when you write a history of the Civil War, right? It, I mean, this, and this is very important for all of us as Southerners and as Mississippians, right? You write a history of the Civil War in the 1890s. What's happening in the 1890s and 1900s in Mississippi when you're writing those histories of the Civil War? Well, trying to reestablish white supremacy, right? Trying to get black folks out of politics. And that, that influences the way you think about the war and what you focus on in the war and what you don't focus on when you write that, right? But, but, but as generations change, you are influenced by your times and your times force you to think about the past in new ways. That's true of historians, but it's also true of novelists, right? That what is happening at the time, they're trying to get some of that into the novel. They're, they're writing the fiction. That's why they're writing. That's why uh, Harper Lee White writes to uh, Go Set a Watchman, is that she's trying in a fictional form to talk in some compelling way about the conflict over race. And, of course, she's doing the same thing in To Kill a Mockingbird. It's just she does it in this indirect, this really sly, clever way of moving the action back 30 years earlier and putting the action in the, in the lives of these small children. But I wanted to understand Harp, Harper Lee's struggle with this character in the context of Southern politics in the late 1950s. And so that's one of the things I try to do in this book, and I think that's one of the mo most important aspects of this book, is to understand how the evolution of the character of Atticus is not driven just by literary concerns of the storyteller, but also by the politics of the day. Now, and I'll say just a little bit about this, and then I'll stop and I'll take your questions. Uh, but what do I mean by that? Uh, 
This, by the way, is a picture of Harper Lee in her college years. This is, this is Harper Lee. I'll, uh, I had something to say about that, but I'm going to skip it for time considerations. Um, what I mean by that is this. Uh, this is a picture, of course, of, of William Faulkner. Um, in 1956, uh, William Faulkner writes a letter to the North. This is after he, he's already a Nobel laureate by this time. He is the dean of not just Southern letters, but the dean of American letters, right? Uh, he is a huge influence on all Southern writers, and is an influence on Harper Lee, certainly. And, and in this letter to the North that he publishes in Life magazine, he writes it in the aftermath of the Authorine Lucy uh, uh, incident at the University of Alabama. Authorine Lucy became the first African-American woman to enroll at the University of Alabama, but it caused great rioting and strife, and she was eventually thrown out of the school. Um, and, um, and, and, and this was an important episode, both in Alabama uh, politics and in uh, Alabama history and in Southern history. And it was very unsettling to see all this rioting that had been taking place in 56. This is before Little Rock, you know, that stuff would happen. There would be a lot more of that to come. This was before Oxford, of course, too, in 62. All, and there was a lot more to that to come. But Arthurine Lucy, was that, that was a, a time of, of, uh, where a lot of that stuff was new. Faulkner is writing this letter to the North. And Faulkner is writing it from a Southern, white Southern defensive position. And it's very much, he's channeling the voice of Gavin Stevens, if for you Faulkner fans, right? The voice of Gavin Stevens from Intruder in the Dust in 1948. And Gavin Stevens is in many ways the, a model for Harper Lee, for the character of Atticus Finch. Gavin Stevens, a, a Southern lawyer who's a kind of, who sees the writing on the wall that the South must change, but he's not happy about it. Right? And he thinks the North, and he's worried that the North is going to try to impose some change on the South, and it's going to cause Southerners to, uh, to overreact. And it's going to be just like Reconstruction all over again. That's what Gavin Stevens talks about, and that's very much the theme of Faulkner's letter to the North that he writes. It's a letter to warn the North go slow. You know, white Southerners are a proud people. And they will not take this outsiders coming in and telling them what to do. You've heard that before, right? Uh, we grew up on that. Uh, and, and that's what Faulkner was saying. And in some ways, that's what Harper Lee was saying, too, in Go Set a Watchman. Because what happens in Go Set a Watchman is that Jean Louise has these, these you know, conversations with um, with Atticus, and she's like, and she's saying, Atticus, you know, the South has got to change, but Atticus, and she's emotional and histrionic, you know, but Atticus is the calm voice of reason, and he explains to Jean Louise the Southern conservative position on, on race in 1957. And over the course of the novel, it's not Atticus, it's not Jean Louise who changes Atticus, it's Atticus who changes Jean Louise's mind over the course of that novel. And of course, the, what Harper Lee's trying to do in that novel is to talk to the reader, to, right? And, and to tell the reader that there is a, a responsible, uh, principled, conservative position on segregation that Southerners have. Um, and, she, and it's her own kind of letter to the North, Go Set a Watchman is. But what's fascinating is to put the content, so she, she sets this aside, this novel's not selling. She's writing this other novel. And what's happening in the South in 1957 and 1958? Well, there's Little Rock in 57 in September, which is a big wake-up call for the nation, right? When you've got a Southern governor who's saying, uh-uh, I'm not going to do it. We're not going to desegregate our schools. We'll close them down rather than desegregate our schools. And, and then what do you have in other Southern states? What you have is a period of militant segregation, uh, a, a politics of militant segregation that nobody would have anticipated happening. If you were looking in 1947, 1948, 1949 in the South, and you were looking forward, you would never have anticipated that there would be that kind of, the rise of this kind of reactionary, massive resistance politics. Because in the year, immediate years after World War II, it was actually a relatively progressive moment in Southern politics. You had the election of Southern governors like Ellis Arnold in Georgia, 
and Big Jim Folsom in Alabama who were actively campaigning to get rid of the poll tax. We don't want the poll tax anymore. And why don't they want the poll tax? Because the poll tax disfranchises uh, black folks and poor white folks. And we want a politics of, of economic progressivism that's going to raise, uh, where a tide that's going to raise all boats, white and black in the South. That was a very progressive uh, position to take. And it looked for a time, if you were a political prognosticator in 1948 in Mississippi, you would have thought that that's the way the future is going to go. It's going to be with folks like that. But that's not what happened, right? What happened in 1954 in the Brown decision, uh, it, it, that set loose a, a set of reactionary forces. And also the Cold War played a role as well because the Cold War gave um, license to our, our senator, Jim Eastland, right, to say anybody who's working for civil rights is probably going to be working for communism. And they may not even know it, but they're, they're, they're probably communists. You know, and so you can, and, and you can undermine civil rights efforts in that way, in that context of the Civil War, I mean, of, of the Cold War. So that's, that's the period in which Harper Lee is writing. And what I think is interesting, and you go back and you look at her personal life and what the little bit of access to her letters that we have, and she's going back from New York to Monroeville, and she's seeing what's happening in Monroeville. And what's happening in Monroeville? Monroeville's getting its first Klan chapter in 1958. They have a Citizens Council chapter, but that's not good enough. They need a Klan chapter. The, the Klan is reviving in Monroeville. What's actually, what else is happening in Alabama in 1958? Uh, there's a gubernatorial election in 1958. And who is this guy? George Wallace, right? And one of the things we forget about George Wallace is that when he ran for governor the first time in 1958, George Wallace was the moderate candidate. George Wallace was the economic progressive who was following in the footsteps of his mentor in Alabama politics, who was Big Jim Folsom. And he was running that year against a man named John Patterson. Now, John Patterson had been a nobody in Alabama politics, just a few years earlier. His father had been somebody. His father was, was a, a candidate for uh, attorney general who was assassinated. Um, and, and young John ran in his place, was elected attorney general, and used that as a springboard to run for governor in 1958. And John Patterson ran with the explicit backing of the Citizens Councils and of the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, in one of the most amazing incidents in Alabama politics, George Wallace tries to use the fact that, jo that the Klan has endorsed John Patterson. And George Wallace gives speeches around the state and says, my candidate has been endorsed by the Klan and he will not renounce that candidate. And he will not renounce that endorsement. Now, are you going to elect a, somebody who's got the explicit endorsement of the Ku Klux Klan? And Alabama voters said, yeah, they are. Because that was the, that was the era of militant segregation, where, where people who were nobodies or jokes just a few years earlier, they're in office in Alabama and in Mississippi. You know, in, Al in, in our states, it's, it's Ross Barnett. Ross Barnett had run for governor three times before and didn't get a sniff at it. But he's elected in 1959, and he makes himself the foremost segregationist running in 1959. That's the, can that's the context in which Harper Lee is revising her book. And what I argue in this book is, and we don't know it for sure because it's fiction, it's hard to say, but what I argue in this book is you can imagine a scenario in which if in Ghost Set of Watchmen, she imagined, who's my audience? You know, who am I writing for? Who, needs to, who do I need to get to hear me? And in Ghost Set of Watchmen, it was the North, right? It was the North who she needed to tell that there were some decent folks down here in the South after all, and y'all folks, don't, you don't realize that. But in To Kill a Mockingbird, when she constructs a character like Atticus Finch, a noble figure who is born of the Southern soil, who is a small town man, who's not traveled widely, not well educated, but who, who has the values, the essential values of the nation. He knows it and feels it in his bones, you know. Who's the audience she's writing for there? I think it's the audience she's writing for there are her own folks, her own people, her own tribe. Not Klansmen, because she knows Ku Klux Klansmen don't read books anyway, right? <laughs> but it's, it's, the, it's what she would have thought of as the, as the decent folks who are being caught up 
in the wave of demagoguery and, and right-wing reactionary politics in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia in the late 50s and 60s. And she's trying to remind them that they have within their own community and within their own traditions uh, principles that they should adhere to and they should live up to. And that's a really uh, important lesson to think about um, Harp, the significance of Harper Lee's fiction, but also to think about today in our own politics and the tensions that we have between conservatism and right-wing politics uh, that we see worked out in our, in our uh, political life today. So thank you. So I spoke a little long, but uh, we still have about 12 minutes for questions. And if you want uh, uh, to ask a question, if you would just raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. But we need to get your question on. Uh, we need to have it amplified. Yes, sir. I have three quick questions. One, do you know Nancy Grisham Anderson? No. Okay. Uh, number two, and this is more serious, and then I have a lighter one. Uh, in your interview in the Clarion Ledger at the end, you said you would like to do possibly a book on racial violence in Knoxville County. Yeah. I just wondered uh, how many incidents have you been able to officially or otherwise formally document in Knoxville County? Yeah. Okay. And then the third one is. Uh, can you tell us about your newspaper delivery in Macon on your bicycle? Uh, I think you, I don't know if you, you might be confusing me with some, I don't, I've never delivered. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, that I'll, I, we'll have to talk afterwards about third question. I'm not sure what that's going. But the second question is important. And it, how many have I been able to document? I, this is a book that I would like to write. And I had more to say about that project, but it got cut out of the interview. But Knox Shibby County is not distinct in the number of incidents uh, of racial violence that it had. Uh, but that's not why I'm interested in it. I'm interested in it for another set of reasons. But a great way to think about the documented incidents of racial violence in Noxubee County or whatever county you want to talk about, y'all should go to the uh, memorial, the lynching memorial in Montgomery. I was over there, uh, Brian Stevens has established, and it's a wonderful, it's a, it's a very important and very powerful memorial uh, that, that helps us remember the history of racial violence in, across the South. And so in, in, they have a plaque for each county. So in the plaque for Noxby County, I think there were probably, I want to say there were eight, uh, eight documented incidents in Noxby County. And the reason it's interesting for me is one of those, the last of those happened in the 1920s. Uh, the man named Dan Carr was lynched. And my great-grandfather was the sheriff of Noxby County at that time. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in that history and want to know more about it. I appreciate you um, relating um, this novel to uh, uh, Faulkner. Now, Faulkner, I believe, wrote Intruding the Dust around 47 or 48. 48. Right, okay, okay. Now, the black character in there, uh, Louis Beecham, I believe, yeah, right. was accused of uh, killing one of, the, one of the, I can't remember the name right now. Right, but in, in, in that in that novel, Beachman Head was kind of highly esteemed. Right, right, and I'm wondering, and then I know about Tom in uh, this novel. Why? And and, 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 and Faulkner wrote it during the time of states' rights too, uh, 1948. Uh, you know, Storm Sturman, mm -hmm. and, and it was made in a movie too. Right. Why do you think that? Uh, to kill a mockingbird, received so much, so much attention than intruding the dust. Yeah, that's a good question. And one of the implications of your question, too, is Lucas Beecham is a really complicated figure 
A much more complicated figure, say, than Tom Robinson. Tom Robinson is just this kind of figure of pity. Lucas Beecham is a proud man, right, who people don't like because he won't bow and scrape, right, like African Americans are expected to do in the Jim Crow South. And Faulkner, uh, Faulkner is just great with that. Uh, and I, I do think it's a shortcoming of the novel that um, To Kill a Mockingbird, that there aren't more fully developed uh, black characters in that novel. But one of the things that's interesting about, to Kill, uh, about Ghost Set of Watchmen, I don't know if you've read it, but I encourage you to go, if you haven't, you should go back and read it and read uh, the character of Calpurnia in Ghost Set of Watchmen is much more interesting uh, than she is in, in To Kill a Mockingbird. And there's a, there's a really powerful scene. I think it's the most powerful scene that Harper Lee ever wrote. And it's the scene where uh, Jean Louise goes to Calpurnia and, and um, I, I won't give it away but it, anyway it's a, it's a confrontation they have a, a very frank discussion where Jean Louise realizes that Calpurnia had kind of been living behind a veil with not only the, the rest of the white community in Maycomb but with the Finches too and that there's this whole other side to Calpurnia that she didn't realize existed you know in terms of it's a much more complicated relationship than they realize. So that's, a, that's, a, um, that's an important uh, piece of that novel. And, and, and I was somewhat critical of, to kill, of, of Ghost Set of Watchmen earlier, but I do think there's some wonderful, wonderful scenes that are part of it. Uh, there's a question right here. Yes. Um, two things. I'm fascinated by her being able to take off a few years and write. Who did she know? I know she knew Truman Capote. Right, right, right. How does that happen? I want to know that too, right? Yeah, yeah. How do you get that a year know, off to write? Know, I know that she and Truman Capote was friends. Yeah. But the other thing that I'm always um, a little interested in uh, processing, how most of the, my colleagues that read To Kill a Mockingbird, what we saw in it as parallels versus what the mainstream saw. Uh, for instance, the subtle disconnect between the educated elite and, and Scout's rejection of the teacher not really understanding the poor student. Mm -hmm. That runs across race. Yeah. And the other part was how it created or brought to light the notion of the good white folk which is still part of the consciousness of blacks. The fact that they never really saw whites as all mm -hmm. against them. That yeah. there, uh, Oprah often speaks about her mother telling her, just be aware and surround yourself with good white folk. So that notion that never gets articulated when I'm hearing whites talk about To Kill a Markenberg, that's part of the culture in terms of African Americans, mm. is there. Mm -hmm. And we read it for some of the same reasons, some of the, some different reasons. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you for that. I, that's uh, that's interesting to hear. In terms of your first question, how do you get a year off from your work? Uh, um, Harper Lee had two really good friends, Joy and Michael Brown. And Michael Brown was not a wealthy guy, but he was a successful. He wrote jingles, and they were such good friends. And Michael Brown had such a belief in Harper Lee as an artist and a writer that when he sold a big jingle and got a big windfall of cash, he and Joy said, you know what, we're going to do this for you because we love you and we believe in you and we want this to, to give you this opportunity. And so it's an extraordinary gift. And she wrote about this in a, very, in a wonderful essay uh, that was published in McCall's, I think, in the early 1960s. But your second point is, is a really powerful one. And I'm... I'm uh, that's right. I do think that Harper Lee, one of the things that she's trying to show in both novels is that there's not just a white community, you know, just like there's not just a black community. You're right. There, there are class divisions and all kinds of, in, in a, particularly in small towns, right, all kinds of divisions that, that people don't see or understand. And I think you're right that, um, that you know, you could talk about Oprah, you know, that, that uh, you know, black folks in the Jim Crow South it was that was important knowledge for them to have, right? Or who were the more decent folks and who were the, who were the folks that you would stay away from? So in some ways, the, the smartest folks about the white community would have been the black community, right? And being able to kind of read the divisions and know because they would have a vested interest in, in not crossing certain whites, right? 
and, 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 and of making allies with others. Um, so, so uh, and that's something that I've tried to write about in my other books about not just, and, and this, this kind of, this gets us in kind of hot water as historians and as thinkers today when we think in abstract terms about kind of a concept like white supremacy, right? And, and, and that's helpful as an analytical tool in some ways to think about big changes over time in history, but it can also... Uh, miss uh, important dynamics in relationships that happen across the color line. Um, so that, thank you for that. That's really helpful. Do you think Harper Lee decided that she did not want that first novel published after the success of her idealistic Atticus Finch? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's clear that, that that thing sat, you know, in a box for 50 years. And, and now maybe she thought it was lost. That's one scenario, we don't know. Um, but one of the things I talk about in the book is I do think she was struggling to try to make that novel work. Um, and I've got some evidence for that at the end of the book where she, in the interviews that she gives and she's talking, uh, they're asking her about her new work. She's not talking about her new work because she doesn't want to jinx it, but she's talking about other things that in some cases she uses direct lines that come from Ghosts of a Watchman and that suggests that she's still struggling with the themes of that novel and trying to make them work in some ways, but she's not able to do it in a successful way. And the epilogue of the book has some reflections on why that might have been. So that's something why you should all go out and buy it. Yeah. Hey, Joe, her, her daddy's editorials really intrigued me. Did he, did he write about uh, Bilbo at all? You know, he didn't write about uh, Bilbo. He wrote about, um, uh, and he wouldn't, he was writing mainly about uh, the folks who were uh, opposing Roosevelt. He loved Roosevelt, and he loved all that Roosevelt was doing for the South through the New Deal. And so the reason why he got so upset about Long and about, Eug about Talmadge is because they were opposing various aspects of Roosevelt's program. You know, Talmadge didn't like the cotton allotment program where you got, the, you know, you had to, the, the federal government told you how much you could or couldn't plant. He's like, I can, nobody's going to tell me who I, how much cotton I can plant. I can plant all the cotton I want. You know, that kind of thing. But, of course, they were trying to bring some... Uh, you know, some rationality to the cotton, the southern cotton market, where you have these huge fluctuations every year. Um, and and, and A.C. Lee saw that and was like, give me a break. This guy's just demagoguing on this issue to win votes. And the same thing with Huey Long. And Huey Long, he was worried about because uh, Huey Long was, 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 you know, positioning himself to run against Roosevelt. And he would have run, many people, most historians think, he would have run against Roosevelt in '36 had he not been assassinated in 1935. Yes, sir. Um, I, think I, <coughs> sorry. I think I understand, I understand you to say that your, your work started in 1933, uh, around that early 1930s, beginning of Roosevelt, and um, it goes on about um, the possibly the um, New Deal. I was wondering if um, I haven't read any of the work, but I'm wondering if um, during that in 1930s you have um, the Great Depression, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if the, your work is anyway has been influenced by the Depression in the 1930s. Yeah. Well, the Depression is very much a, a almost a character in To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, it's not influencing the work directly because she's writing two decades later in the 1950s, but the setting of the Depression and the idea that everybody's suffering and everybody, it, it, it kind of increases in some ways in the novel To Kill a Mockingbird, it increases the kind of cohesiveness of the, of the community, that everybody, um, everybody is, is suffering under that burden in the 1930s. Yes, sir. We have reached the top of the hour. I know that Joe is happy to stick around and answer any questions. And let me remind you that we have copies of his books for sale just across the wall there in the Mississippi Museum store. Thank you all for coming today. Help me thank Joe Crispino for this talk. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.